Um, for those of you guys, uh, thanks for coming on, Dr. Bilski. And um, uh, for those of you guys who ha didn't know, uh, I spent a year with Dr. Bilski at New York prior to joining you guys. Um, and just want to introduce him briefly. He did his uh, undergrad at Michigan, his med school at Emory, uh, trained at Cornell for residency, uh, went to Louisville uh, for a fine fellowship. And um, as everyone uh, in this audience knows, he's kind of been the pioneer in the spine tumor field, has completely uh, redefined the field in the last uh, 20 years. So uh, keep it short and sweet, and uh, we'll listen to his experience on how he treats spine tumors. Ryan, thank you. And uh, Thanks, I, yeah. I so appreciate it. I, I We're going to try to do a whirlwind of what we're really interested in at the moment with a little bit of a historical review. But I think, um, y you know, there's so much, and we can talk a lot about primary tumors. The focus is really going to be on metastatic tumors, which is far and away your bigger problem. 20% of cancer patients will develop spine metastases over the course of their illness. And we've definitely seen an increased number over the past 10 to 15 years, partly as an ascertainment issue that MR and FTG PET have improved detection, but also the systemic treatments have now improved survival. But the biologic and checkpoint inhibitors are much more effective for visceral than for bone disease. So we think we're going to see a continued uptick in the number of tumors that we're responsible for. And despite this improved survival, the treatment for metastatic disease remains palliative. We want to improve and maintain neurologic function, achieve local tumor control, mechanical stability, pain relief, improve quality of life, and an early turn to systemic therapy. And if we get this kind of outcome of a patient who underwent uh, separation surgery for an L3 mechanical radiculopathy, who did this 100-mile paddle on this Whitewater River three months after surgery, we've clearly met that job of palliation versus this patient who has both failed fixation and a radiation recall burn, require extension of hardware and a free flap reconstruction. And everything we've done in the past 30 years is to mitigate this kind of outcome. From a historical perspective, up through the 1990s, we really had two treatment options, laminectomy without instrumentation and conventional external beam radiation. Laminectomy without instrumentation was a terrible operation. It created iatrogenic instability deformity, progressive pain, and often neurologic decline. Compared to conventional external beam radiation, as early as 1978, we knew that solid tumors were what they called unfavorable responders to that typical dosing of 30 gray and 10 fractions, or what we now call radioresistant. Despite the poor outcomes to conventional radiation, it was still as effective as decompressive laminectomy with less morbidity and became standard of care. By the 1990s, we had significant improvement in surgery with the development of segmental instrumentation, transarterial embolization for hypervascular tumors, and the Patchell study 2005 showed that surgery was better than conventional radiation for solid tumor malignancies. And we began to see this proliferation of incredibly aggressive approaches, including the highly morbid on-block spinalectomy for metastatic tumors. During this period, the treatment algorithms were largely surgically based, such as the Tamita and Takahashi scores. By 2010, we had uh, the development, evolution, and integration of transformative technology for metastatic disease in the form of stereotactic radiosurgery. It's defined as high-dose perfection conformal photon beam delivery, often given a 16 to 24 gray single fraction or 24 to 30 gray and three fractions. And compared to conventional external beam radiation at 30 gray and 10 fractions, the responses to radio surgery are both histology independent and ablative. And that fundamentally changed our indications for and type of surgery that we do. For those patients who potentially would have been candidates for on block resection previously, we could now do definitive radio surgery. The concept of hybrid therapy in patients with high-grade cord compression, instead of doing a gross total resection of this massive uh, tumor uh, resection, we now only decompress the epidural space followed by radiosurgery, and it allows us to do minimally invasive stabilization techniques such as kyphone vertebroplasty because we could get tumor control with radiation rather than with tumor resection. During this treatment, it, this integration of radiosurgery mandated that our treatment algorithms become multimodality. At Memorial, we use the GNOMES decision framework, where radiosurgery is fundamentally the most important for tumor control, and surgery is largely used as an adjuvant. Uh, surgery is largely an adjuvant to radiosurgery for decompression and stabilization. In the GNOMES framework, there are four sentinel decision points, neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability, and systemic disease. We largely leave it as a decision framework so that we can integrate evidence-based medicine and new technologies as they become available. But as you can see on the right, it can be an algorithm at any point in time. 
um, uh, such as you see here. Uh, in the gnomes framework, the neurologic and oncologic considerations are made in combination. For a neurologic perspective, we're very concerned about myelopathy and functional radiculopathy, but much of the decision making is based on the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. There's a scoring system that's been validated where zero is bone only, one A, B, and C are different degrees of epidural impingement without spinal cord compression. Two is spinal cord compression, but CSF seen. Three, spinal cord compression, no CSF seen. And for decision-making purposes, the twos and threes uh, traditionally are considered to be high-grade cord compression. From an oncologic perspective, what we're really talking about is how we achieve local tumor control, which is completely predicated on radiosensitivity. And radiosensitivity has been completely redefined as we've transitioned from external beam radiation the stereotactic radiosurgery. There's very little in the literature that looked at differential radiosensitivity based on tumor histology to conventional radiation in that 30 gray and 10 fractions. But what's there was remarkably consistent. There are radiosensitive tumors, such as the hematologic malignancies, lymphoma, myeloma, and then the hormone-driven solid tumor malignancies, breast and prostate. The remainder of the solid tumors are largely radioresistant with meeting durable responses of three months and two-year local control rates of only 30%. Here's a patient with multiple myeloma uh, with T10 to 12, very high-grade cord compression, presenting as an Asia C, three out of five in the lower extremities. Patient was put on high-dose steroids, got conventional external beam radiation, 30 gray and 10 fractions. You can see the 10-day follow-up film. The tumor completely apoptosed, decompressing the spinal cord and recovering the patient to normal neurologic function. The problem is that you'll never see these responses in the radio-resistant tumors. And for that reason, patients with radio-resistant tumors with minimal no spinal cord compression go straight to stereotactic radiosurgery. Here's our series of a little over 800 tumors, again, mostly for radio-resistant tumor histologies, where we had a definitive target for radiation with the SEC score zero to one C. Uh, at a median follow-up of a little over two years. Contours were according to Radio Surgery Consortium guidelines. There were two dose cohorts defined. The median dose of the planning target volume and the low dose cohort was 16.4 gray single fraction versus the high dose cohort 22.4 gray. The only factor significant in the insulocal failure was the dose of radiation, but even in the low dose cohort, at a year, we only had a 5% failure rate, but it increased to 20% at four years. In the high-dose cohort, we had less than 1% chance of failure at a year, increasing to only 2.1% at four years. In the high-dose cohort, we're giving an ablative dose of radiation. These responses are both histology and volume independent, unlike conventional external beam radiation. Over the past decade, it's been used to define dose constraints for organs at risk. The spinal cord, a cord D max of 14 gray, we have less than a 1% chance of creating myelitis. But it's this dose constraint on the spinal cord that prevents us from treating high grade cord compression because either we'll underdose at the margin of the cord to remain within constraints of normal tissue tolerance of the spinal cord and risk epidural progression where we need the greatest control over overdose at the margin of the cord and create radiation myelitis. We are working on a number of strategies to, to treat higher grade cord compression within the constraints of normal tissue tolerance. Amal Gia at MD Anderson has relaxed spinal cord constraints to cord DMAX of 16 gray, which actually may be a very important number because we think while the 24 gray number is really important, there's also a minimum dose below 15 gray where we start to see recurrences. And so getting to that 16 gray number may actually be significant. At Memorial, we've reported a series of hypofractionated radiation of 24 to 30 gray in three fractions for grade two compression with one and two year local recurrences of 10 and 22%. So it's not as good as single fraction for those patients who can't tolerate uh, a surgical decompression. It's a very effective strategy. And much of our effort uh, more recently has been using combination therapy. Uh, there's very good experimental and clinical evidence that stereotactic radiosurgery in combination with VEGF TKIs act as radio sensitizers. Radio sensitizers so in essence, you can lower the dose of radiation from that 24 gray number to 14 or 16 and still get the same response as you get at 24 gray. The concept of radiomodulated air is a combination of superoxide dismutase mimetics with stereotactic radiosurgery converts superoxide to peroxide. And it's peroxide that's actually toxic to cancer cells and well tolerated by normal cells. So again, you can increase the dose of radiation uh, and decrease the toxicity while maintaining uh, excellent tumor control. 
And then the concept of immune modulation, the combination of checkpoint inhibitors with stereotactic radiosurgery, we reported many, many years ago about the obscopal effect where you give local radiation and get a systemic disease response, but it can also augment local tumor control. We just completed a phase one trial for recurrent chordoma, where there seems to be a pretty good signature there that it is an effective strategy for those patients. Here's our first patient that we saw. This was actually a renal cell in the sacrum. It was twice irradiated and the patient had failed. They had severe unremitting pain, loss of bowel and bladder function. Um, Dr. Yamato wasn't willing to treat the entire tumor volume for fear of skin toxicity. And so they only treated the center core of this tumor, 27 gray and three fractions, in combination with dual checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see it a month the tumor started to necrose, and by two months, the uh, DCE images, the plasma volume images, show that the tumor is dead. And so this combination of, of selective radiation to a small portion of the tumor creates an antigen sink, and then these checkpoint inhibitors uh, have a T-cell-mediated cytotoxicity and can kill the tumor. And we're beginning to employ that in patients who either have a current tumor or aren't candidates for um, for radiation to entire tumor volumes due to toxicity. And again, in chordoma, there's a very good signature. These are relatively immunogenic tumors, despite the fact um, that they don't have a big T cell population, but we've seen very good responses uh, in this trial, which hopefully will be reported out soon. The problem is that even if any of these strategies work for high-grade cord compression, we get no effective immediate decompression of the epidural tumor. As in this case, it takes a couple of months for the tumor uh, to actually die and begin to involute and essentially decompress uh, the epidural space. And for that reason, patients with radio-resistant tumors with high-grade cord compression still go to surgery followed by radiosurgery. This is still largely predicated on the Patchell study, published Lancet 2005. It's a prospective randomized trial of solid tumors with myelopathy, comparing surgery and conventional external beam to conventional external beam alone. And in every outcome variable, surgery was better than radiation. And based on that and a number of other studies, the Spine Oncology Study Group made a strong recommendation that patients with high-grade spinal cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergo surgical decompression stabilization, followed by radiation therapy. And the question became what kind of surgery and what kind of radiation. With the integration of radiosurgery as a post-operative adjuvant, the surgical goals of spinal cord decompression for neurologic salvage and using screw rod systems to provide mechanical stability remain the same. What changed, right, is the oncology. How we achieve local tumor control is still completely predicated on the radiation response. So when we use conventional external beam radiation as a post-operative adjuvant, we often did maximally cytoreductive surgery, the gross total resection or on block. With radiosurgery as a post-operative adjuvant, maybe the only goal has to be to reconstitute the fecal sac to create a better and safer target for radiation. That became known as separation surgery. Here's an 86-year-old female with thyroid cancer, Asia C, with very high-grade cord compression, three-level vertebral body disease. And I would submit to you that there is no way to get this patient through a three-level front-back surgery. In separation surgery, um, traditionally, we instrument um, uh, two levels above and below the index level. We take a high-speed drill and drill off the lamina, superior and inferior facet joint, and pedicle flush to the vertebral body. We find normal dural planes and strip the tumor off of the dura, and then cut the posterior longitudinal ligament across the anterior dura to affect a margin in that plane. And you can see from a posterior only approach, we can do a very effective circumferential decompression uh, and reconstitution of the thecal sac. The goal of separation surgery is not to take out all of the tumor, but simply to reconstitute the thecal sac to create a better target for radiation. Why do we like separation surgery as a strategy in metastatic spine disease? It's very short operating times, typically two, two and a half hours. We can do emergency operations for epidural tumors in the middle of the night without the need for an access surgeon or the incumbent morbidity associated with anterior approaches. And we can do these large volume, multi-compartmental tumors, such as the one seen on the right, where our only real obligation is to resect tumor within this blue circle to reconstitute the thecal sac, leaving the remainder of the tumor for radiosurgery. 
And ultimately, we do a better and safer epidural decompression because we're always working from normal dural planes and we're always pushing the tumor away from uh, known uh, known dura. In terms of approach morbidity, C12 is a very hard area to access uh, in the setting of metastatic disease particularly. This was a primary tumor, 45-year-old low-grade chondrosarcoma. Uh, and you can see this tumor circumferentially around uh, the spine. The best approach for this is a transmandibular osteotomy, uh, cutting uh, the mandible, and then a transpharyngeal approach uh, to this tumor. And it, the problem with this in the metastatic population is just from the approach alone, the patients have to be pregnant trach for at least two weeks after the surgery. In this case, we put an anterior cage and it was very in vogue to try to get bone graft across this, despite the fact that all of the load in C1, C2 comes through the posterior elements. There was really not a great need to reconstruct there. And at seven years, we were looking through the mouth at uh, the cage. We had to hiss the posterior pharynx and had to go back and take out this cage and ultimately uh, do a pharyngeal reconstruction. And you can see we really didn't need to do that at all. We got a very good bone graph uh, uh, posteriorly for this patient. Uh, in counterdistinction to that, this is a 33-year-old female, had multiple fibroids resected. She was three months pregnant, tripped on an airplane jetway, and became acutely quadriplegic with a C1 to uh, high-grade epidural disease and this large uh, paraspinal mass. We did emergency simple separation surgery, assuming she would not tolerate a transmandibular osteotomy and an occipital cervical fusion. She recovered by the grace of goodness to be neurologically normal at two months. The tumor ended up being a low-grade uterine lyomysarcoma. So one of those fibroids actually had sarcoma in it. At the time, we gave her adjuvant conformal photon beam radiation, conventionally fractionated 66 gray and 33 fractions. Today, we would do a hypofractionated regimen of 30 gray and three fractions, either using high-dose conformal photons or proton beam radiation. Here's the baby at the age of two, was born about three months after the surgery. Here's the tumor that we left behind after the separation surgery that got her neurologic recovery. Here's her 15-year follow-up film with no evidence of residual recurrent tumor. It's not about the amount of tumor you take out. It's about the response to radiation that gives you durable long-term tumor control. Similarly, here's a 54-year-old female with a high cervical myelopathy and clumsy hand syndrome with needle biopsy. We knew this was chordoma. Uh, we can talk a lot about uh, chordoma and the response to radiation, but in this case, they were not a candidate for on-block resection due to high-grade cord compression, bilateral vertebral artery involvement, and this large parapharyngeal mass. Instead of taking her for that transmandibular osteotomy, we did simple separation surgery to reconstitute the thecal sac, leading all that paraspinal tumor behind. We gave her 24 gray single fraction. Here's a seven-year follow-up film with no evidence of residual recurrent tumor. Uh, improvements to separation surgery. Traditionally, we went long segment fixation, minimum two levels above and below the index level to distribute load in osteoporotic bone, which is almost ubiquitous in this patient population, and to prevent failure from adjacent segment progression. And we did remarkably well with that with a fixation failure rate of only 2.8%. More recently, we've gone to short segment fixation with cement augmented fenestrated pedicle screws, which both overcome osteoporosis and the potential morbidity from adjacent segment progression. And our fixation failure rate in our first 44 patients with 11 month follow up was 2.2%. We have a longer term follow up now with a larger series, and it remains in that, in that um, spectrum of about a 3.1% failure rate. So, a very effective strategy that reduces morbidity by shortening this construct with cement augmented screws. Um, and more and more, as uh, as Dr. Munis has been a great proponent of minimally invasive techniques, uh, we're starting to integrate those into uh, separation surgery, certainly in the lumbar spine for things like mechanical radiculopathy. We do percutaneous pedicle screws and then tubular decompression um, of the nerve root. In terms of separation surgery, performance status, 75% uh, uh, of our non-ambulatory patients regain the ability to walk and overall 90% are ambulatory. In terms of patient reported outcomes, patients do significantly well in terms of pain right now and general activity. In terms of long-term local tumor control, in the only series reporting longitudinal follow-up on these patients after aggressive surgery, followed by conventional external beam radiation, the local control 
was only 30% of the year. And one of the biggest predictors of recurrence, as you would imagine, is tumor histology. That's in counterdistinction to our initial series of separation surgery followed by radiosurgery in 186 patients. Most were operated for high-grade cord compression with radioresistant tumors, and 50% had failed prior radiation. There were three postoperative adjuvant strategies, high-dose single fraction, 24 gray, high-dose hypofractionated, 8 to 10 gray times 3, or low-dose hypofractionated. The one-year cumulance of recurrence was 16%, but if we gave a high enough dose single or high-dose hypofractionated radiation, we had less than 10% recurrence at a year. And again, there was no association with radio-resistant tumor histologies. We overcome radio-resistance with high-dose perfraction radiation. More recently, we looked at histology-specific outcomes from what we now call hybrid therapy. In this case, it was separation surgery followed by a median dose of 8 to 10 gray times three fractions, and renal cell carcinoma, the two-year progression-free survival was 92%, non-small cell lung cancer, 95%, and colon cancer, a little less well, at 87%. We looked at mutation status, and if the patient had an EGFR mutation, non-small cell lung cancer, and was treatment naive, there was a 50% improved overall and progression-free survival, and in colon carcinoma, APC was a negative prognostic mutation. Now, the question, I think, for orthopedists uh, who do some of this, and we'll definitely see this in your practice, the nightmare is how do you deal with the myelopathy that comes into the emergency room with a patient who's never had a history of tumor, tumor of unknown histology? And um, those patients are going to be one of three. It's going to be a solid tumor where we've already defined that in this setting, uh, separation surgery followed by radiosurgery is incumbent. For hematologic malignancies, if you know the diagnosis definitively, the argument would be made that you can do conventional external beam radiation in the absence of instability. And then chordoma, uh, the argument has been made that those patients absolutely need an on block resection for marginal or wide margins. My recommendation to you is not to wait for a um, uh, a needle biopsy to make a definitive determination. And the reason is, if it's solid tumor, we've already made the argument that you need to take them to surgery. For hematologic malignancies, it is very difficult to make a definitive diagnosis in a timely fashion. And while you're waiting two or three or four or five days for that definitive diagnosis to come back, patients who are myelopathic will often, even on high-dose steroids, acutely decompensate and fall off the cliff. And as you know, the better they are neurologically going in, the better chance you have of having them come out neurologically in good shape and ambulatory. So we don't, even if we suspect it's a hematologic malignancy, oftentimes we'll take them for urgent surgery. And in point of fact, with multiple myeloma, the vast majority of the time when they come in as that type of emergency, they're also grossly unstable. So you get to chordoma, and I'm just going to tell you that um, high-grade cord compression in chordoma precludes an on-block uh, resection for wider marginal margins. There's simply no way to do that, and certainly not in the emergency setting where you're trying to preserve neurologic function. Um, and so uh, even if it ends up being chordoma, uh, you're good to take them, even for just separation surgery, and I'll show you the data for that. So here is a patient who came in sorry, 53-year-old presented Asia C at an outside hospital with no preceding cancer history and had this T10 vertebral body disease with two-level high-grade epidural. And again, they're Asia C, they're three out of five with no history of cancer. My very good friend and colleague in Connecticut took this patient for simple separation surgery uh, with this reconstruction, and they came back with a diagnosis of chordoma. And we have a very big experience with hypofractionated radiation for chordoma. It's incredibly effective. The problem here is we didn't have enough room uh, separation surgery to give a definitive dose of radiation. And so we took them back and re-decompressed to reconstitute the thecal sac and give ourselves a margin. And we actually re-instrumented him. He's a, a very active football coach who's going back. So we re-instrumented with cement augmented screws, a dual rod construct. And we actually turned a vascularized rib graft for posterior lateral fusion. Uh, we gave the patient 24 gray single fraction. Here's a 36 month follow-up with no evidence of residual recurrent tumor. Should you take these patients without a diagnosis, even if it ends up being chordoma, here's our series of chordomas with 35 patients, half from the mobile spine, half in the sacrum. 
Um, in the mobile spine, uh, we gave, if we had a target for radiation, we often uh, just did uh, stereotyped rate of surgery, 24 gray single fraction. Uh, and then there were a series of patients who had high grade cord compression, like the one I showed you with or without myelopathy of those uh, six underwent uh, curatage gross total resection and seven underwent simple separation surgery followed by radiation where we tried to get into a mean dose of 24 gray and in the cohort that got 24 gray single fraction regardless of whether they got it as definitive treatment or post-operative adjuvant or in the case of uh, the sacrum we often did it as neoadjuvant radiation the five-year local recurrence-free survival was 90 percent which is really uh, quite uh, quite good now there's a in the mobile spine, there's an AO mobile spine series, 166 patients, where they showed that if they did an on block resection, um, they did significantly better than intralesional. And that makes sense. In that series, radiation ended up being a negative prognostic variable. And of course, the question isn't, uh, there's a multitude of problems with that, but the biggest one is that they could not tell you what kind of radiation or what dose they got. If we overlay our series of patients who were really unresectable for cure, so essentially the vast majority of those patients would have been for onakin inappropriate uh, resection. We didn't just pull the onakin appropriate curve down, we pulled the onakin inappropriate curve below the onakin appropriate. So you can salvage these patients effectively with radiation if they're not a candidate for on-block resection. So we talked about the neurologic oncologic. Mechanical instability is a separate assessment because no matter radiation will stabilize an unstable spine. The SINS criteria was developed to find instability in the plastic setting. There are six criteria uh, which are weighted by their contribution to instability. Location, a junctional mobile spine have a higher point score than semi-rigid or rigid spine. Pain, yes, is mechanical pain. It's movement-related axial load pain versus non-mechanical pain, which is what we call biologic pain. It's night or morning pain that resolves over the course of the day. It really just denotes um, a tumor-related pain as opposed to fracture-related. Bone, uh, lytic uh, bone destruction has a higher point score than mixed or blastic. Subluxation translation has the highest point score. Degree of arterial body collapse or involvement, and then whether the posterior elements are involved, bilateral, unilateral, or none. And they're weighted by their contribution and stability, uh, with zero to six being stable, seven to 12 potentially unstable, and greater than 13 unstable. Um, we see a huge number, as I'm sure you do, of bursa compression fractures, which fall into that indeterminate category. These are often very good candidates for standalone uh, kyphoplasty. over tiboplasty. And there is class one evidence from the CAFE study, which is now relatively old from 2011, that patients undergoing kyphoplasty versus best medical management have significantly been better pain control at a month durable out to a year. So we're very aggressive in those painful compression fractures, basically with a VAS greater than seven of taking them for cement augmentation. It turns out that if you have a burst or compression fracture with extension into the posterior element, you can't do standalone kyphoplasty. They need to be backed up with a posterior tension band, which we now do with cement augmented percutaneous pedicle screws with kyphoplasty at the index level. And this has been a very effective strategy. We looked at 46 patients. Now, again, in an old series that's being updated where they went from severe pain to mild or no pain postoperatively. And then there are patients like this with a C12 fracture subluxation SIN score is unstable who need open decompression fixation across that segment. We do not have to date at least percutaneous procedures uh, that are well, well developed for the cervical spine. Um, in general, we don't really worry too much about deformity in these patients. It's not really their big priority. It's getting them decompressed and stabilized. Um, without worrying about a big deformity correction. But there are times where deformity is the problem. And we see it a lot in patients with head and neck cancer or heavily irradiated, and they get really fibrous sternocleidomastoids and end up with significant chin on chest deformity. They're not actually unstable, they're deformed. The SIN score here was only five. One of the really effective strategies because they're so fibrotic in the sternocleidomastoids is to simply inject them with Botox, which releases that fibrosis, and then you can get them back into position. Uh, and in this case, we went O to T3, and um, he is the happiest guy in the world. He is fixed in a halo. He cannot rotate, flex or extend, 
and yet it's infinitely better than where he was, which was looking at the ground, uh, unable to uh, engage uh, unless he really slumped down in a chair and then he could potentially do it. But he is one of the happiest patients I have, despite how morbid um, that that um, construct is in terms of uh, flexibility of the neck. Um, more and more, we're trying to get away from uh, uh, procedures and use uh, uh, percutaneous uh, pain procedures. One of the things we've started to see a lot of, for whatever reason, I did not see early in my career, are these C1 lateral mass fractures. And ultimately, when that bone fractures down, it settles, so their neck pain gets better. But what they are left with is severe, unremitting occipital neuralgia, uh, pain going up the back of their head. And we used to do OC fusion with a C12 laminectomy to decompress the nerve. And now the interventionalists do these simple C2 nerve root ablations with about 80% of patients not requiring further therapy. And again, everything you do in the cancer population is to mitigate morbidity or recovery time uh, to get patients back to systemic therapy. The other place we've seen are these sacral insufficiency fractures, either from tumor or radiation, and they have intractable pelvic pain and are completely bed bound. Previously, we've done bed rest till they healed, which was sometimes an impossibility. We did sacroplasty for a while and had about a 50% response rate. And then instrumented fusion is not a great strategy here because the bone quality often isn't good enough uh, to hold fixation. Um, and then uh, we actually were presenting these at tumor board and the interventional pain person said, I can fix these. And they now do these uh, uh, cluneal nerve, L5 to S3 dorsal branch ablations, and they basically denervate the pain to the sacrum. And despite the fractures not healing, they get up next day and walk. It's one of the most remarkable things I've seen and really fixed a problem that we thought was unfixable in our patient population. So don't be afraid to engage your interventionalist. Um, I, in fact, Udi Mendel was just considering um, a hemicorporectomy for an ulcerated a massive sacral tumor. A uh, patient was on ketamine drips uh, almost around the clock, and they ended up doing a cingulotomy in the brain to denervate that, and the patient is pain-free. So there are lots of pain procedures that are now being invoked that are remarkably effective for these, um, uh, these uh, cancer patients. Um, the last issue is you've made the determination, neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability, maybe they need surgery or radiation. The question is, from a systemic disease and medical comorbidity standpoint, is whether it makes any sense in the context of where they are. Survival is often used as a determinant uh, to decide whether a patient should undergo surgery or radiation. And in the era of biologics and checkpoint inhibitors, we basically have extended survival for every patient population. And so we lost the ability in some ways. It, with chemotherapy, we kind of knew to the day how long they would take to progress. And then we, there's a new biologic checkpoint inhibitor for virtually every disease. Here for melanoma, single checkpoint inhibitor more than triple the survival compared to a standard chemotherapy. That's reflected in our survival curves following surgery, um, where uh, we looked at a 20-year survival trend and there was a 20% improvement over that time period, largely reflective of the integration of these newer systemic agents. Um, fortunately, in the era of biologic and checkpoint inhibitors, two predictive models of survival were developed, and these can be found online and very easily integrated into your uh, treatment decision. The SORG nomogram uh, and the New England Metastatic Spine Score, they were both developed in the Harvard system. They're incredibly easy to use and at least give you some sense of whether that patient is going to be, you know, barely going to get to a 30 day survival versus a year or two years. And so I would encourage you to go online if you're really struggling with whether it makes sense to take somebody to surgery based on survival. These are very useful uh, models and again, very easy to use. Um, we don't always um, use our predictive survivals as well as we should. Sometimes uh, um, you look at a patient, you get so compelled by them that you take them and end up, you know, potentially doing the wrong thing. But this is a 60-year-old, non-small cell lung cancer, transferred from an outside hospital, status post RT chemo, um, and had recently failed a clinical trial. The problem was he'd been operated before, and he broke. Uh, his hardware on one side, pulled out his screws on the other side. So he was grossly unstable across cervical thoracic junction. Um, he had this high grade cord compression, but he also had a percutaneous drain in that was just pouring blood out. 
and I thought that this was probably a huge clot, um, and it ended up at surgery being um, tumor. We got a medical clearance note. Um, everything said we shouldn't go to surgery, so prolonged uh, ventilator dependence. He did have a pleural effusion, and we drained that preoperatively. And one of my biggest contraindications of surgery is if you if you cannot maintain platelets, you shouldn't take that patient to surgery because you're going to end up chasing them postoperatively. And the platelet count was low, but with transfusion, he held to over 100K. And I think this was before we were using M-plate pretty routinely. So now some of these patients, even if they have chemotherapy-related thrombocytopenia, you can give them a biologic N-plate that will drive their platelet count up and maintain it. Um, and so there's ways to correct that. Here, we just transfused and he held. Sorgnomogram told us he wasn't going to survive more than 30 days, and yet he couldn't move. He literally was wide awake. Um, and this was his only compelling issue. Uh, he wasn't on oxygen, um, but he was certainly debilitated and deconditioned. And so I went ahead and took him because there, there's nothing you can't fix, right? It's not a particularly hard fix, right? We took out the screws. Uh, uh, we uh, took out the rod. We extended him up to C2 and then um, cement augmented him uh, below. And so um, the pro and he did fine for two days. He was great. He was infinitely. We took this tumor off the spinal cord and decompressed him all the way down. Um, he did not get any recovery of function, but you know, this big mass was out and he was he died at 31 days after two prolonged ICU stays. So, you know, sometimes these targets look so inviting, you really are compelled to do something. And the reality is you're not going to be meaningful for them. Uh, and, and so you have to make that determination, even if you have the NOM is hundred percent, you should take them. You really have to look at the morbidity from what you're going to do and make that determination. Um, there are other things that are being integrated in the systemic disease assessment, particularly for oligometastatic disease, which is defined as one to five metastases. The saber Kama trial is a randomized open legal phase two European trial that looked at standard therapy versus either conventional external beam radiation or radio surgery to every site of metastatic disease. And with local radio surgery in combination with standard therapy, there was a significant overall survival advantage. So now you'll see some of these asymptomatic metastases in the spine or other bones or visceral getting irradiated, trying to tap into the survival effect. The PISA trial was a memorial trial. It was a randomized bone only trial. 50% of those tumors were spine comparing what we think is ablative radiation, 24 grade single fraction versus nine grade times three. And the two year local recurrence Free survival was better in the patients who got 24 gray, which was expected, but there was also a decrease in distant metastases if you got a blade of radiation. And so again, for these bone metastases, when you have widespread prostate cancer in the spine with less than five metastases, they'll often go to radiosurgery, again, trying to tap into that effect of both better local tumor control, but also decreasing distant metastases. This may not be particularly interesting for this, but you're going to be asked for this group, but you may be asked to do a spine biopsy in somebody who's already had a biopsy of a lung or a liver lesion, trying to figure out what the driver mutation is of the metastatic disease. And Ori Barzillai looked at our data on patients who had a primary site tumor, spine, or visceral metastases, and it turned out that the metastases may be different in spine versus visceral versus uh, the primary site, but the driver mutation, the targetable mutation is maintained. And so if you have a spine biopsy and you have a targetable mutation, you may not have to biopsy a second site. And that kind of, you, you will be asked to do that on occasion. We certainly have done it multiple times. And now we have data that particularly for non-small cell lung cancer, prostate and breast, we actually don't have to do that. So in the GNOMES framework, as it stands today, um, for patients, well, let's see, my arrows are gonna come, oops, let's see. Huh. My arrows aren't, that's so interesting. Um, for patients with middle nose spinal cord compression, um, sorry, patients with radio resist, radio sensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of cord compression can still go to conventional radiation. For radio-resistant tumors with minimal no spinal cord compression, those ESCC scores zero to one C, we go to radiosurgery. And for radio-resistant tumors with high-grade cord compression, 
We do simple separation surgery followed by radio surgery. Again, mechanical instability is a separate assessment because no matter radiation will stabilize an unstable spine. And once you determine instability, patients are often candidates for kyphovertebral plasty, perk screws, or potentially open surgery, or now some of these ablation procedures. And everything is predicated on what the patient can tolerate from a systemic disease standpoint, what makes sense in the context of the disease and what they can tolerate. So a 78-year-old male, right? Stage four papillothyroid cancer, BRAF positive. He's got neck and mediastinal lymph nodes at presentation, underwent thyroidectomy and solumetinib with RAI. Uh, two years later, he develops back pains, biologic in nature. His severe axial load and recumbency pain suggestive of mechanical instability. His neurologic exam uh, shows that he's um, uh, neurologically normal. Uh, so five out of five with normal proprioception. He's got lots of medical issues, cardiac and lung, and then systemic workup shows he's got lots of bone disease and a pulmonary nodule. And you can see this really high-grade cord compression with a burst fracture and a tight extension of the posterior elements, bilateral posterior element involvement. And I just think you look at this as a resident or a fellow, even as an attending, and there's just so much data there. It's like, how do you make sense of that? And at least for us, it's just very simple to put them in a framework that we can start to parse out what's important. And so this patient neurologically is Asia E with uh, no functional radiculopathy, but he does have high grade cord compression with a tumor that is resistant to conventional external beam radiation, papillothyroid, but exquisitely sensitive to radio surgery, but we don't have a target. He is grossly unstable. If you go through his SIN score, he's SINs 14. Systemic disease, his SORG nomogram we put into was a 50% one year survival. And then you need a medical clearance, or his heart and lungs okay, and he was moderate risk. And so he's a very good candidate if you put him into the GNOMES framework for hybrid therapy, separation surgery, followed by radio surgery. GNOMES is a cornerstone of coordinated comprehensive care in the modern management of spine metastases. We have these massive multidisciplinary efforts. As you know, it's not simply what the surgeon thinks or the radiation oncologist or the interventional radiologist. We need to make very consistent, timely, evidence-based decisions. Um, and part of what GNOMES did was when we came together, it allows us to collaborate to create clinical and translational research. And so when you see these patients in any system, it's, it's a very good way to integrate these massive uh, uh, stakeholders uh, to come up with very consistent decisions that work in your institution. And for us, um, we are interested in lots of things right now. I think in the surgical domain, um, we're very interested in promoting what you all are very good at, which is getting better at MIS for metastatic spine tumors. We have a big Da Vinci robot program for schwannomas and think there may be a role for the da Vinci robot for anterior approaches for tumor, but it's really gonna take the development of, of, of drills to be able to do that. And then how do we actively, and, and from a financial standpoint, begin to integrate peak carbon fiber. In radio surgery, uh, we're looking at adaptive MR simulation, but the big push now with the proliferation of proton beam is how we begin to integrate that. And we have now started uh, a program, I think the first in the world of hypofractionated protons. Instead of doing six weeks of radiation, we, for metastatic disease, are doing three days in many of these patients. Uh, clinical research, we're interested in things uh, with the um, uh, recruitment of uh, Chris Newman of financial toxicity and price transparency in spine oncology. And I think they've published now their first four papers on that. We have a lot of prospective trials. A lot of them are really trying to integrate uh, radio surgery with things like checkpoint inhibitors or these um, uh, uh, or these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and then lots of basic science effort um, as well. The most recent of which are really looking at radiomics to pr predict pathologic fracture risk and radiogenomics, looking at tumor mutation profiles, as I've shown you a little bit. And with that, I will end um, and take any questions uh, that you have. Thanks, awesome. Dr. Bilski. It's Hanny. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you. I mean, for those of us that are in the community trying to take care of these super complicated patients with a ton of information, like you said, to have a framework that we can rely upon so that we use evidence-based medicine appropriately, it is a huge relief. Um, so it's really appreciated greatly. I think, thanks. So, yeah, I think it was, it was, you know, we were in the same situation when we started 
gnomes. It was like, I don't even know what to do. Like, I'm just looking at these right. patients. There's just too much stuff. And so we broke it down. Then you can start to integrate evidence-based medicine, but it really, um, it, it's just helpful to get organized. You know, that's all it is, you know. As, I do have a question. So you're at the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, when you talk to community hospitals or um, it sounds like this, th this approach ends up being a lot more uh, doable uh, relative to, you know, massive on block resections, for instance, right? Now, there's not many surgeons who are going to have a skill set or feel comfortable doing, doing that. But it also looked like when you talk about separation surgery, you're talking, you're not really talking about like just a true, just regular laminectomy. You really are saying reconstitute the fecal sac. So whatever that means in the context of the imaging, that's what you have to do. And even if it means taking down facet joints, getting to the front of the spine, taking down the PLL, it, am I understanding that correctly? Like separation surgery, don't think of it as so much as doing a laminectomy, think of it more as circumferentially removing tumor burden so that the the uh, stereotactic radio surgery or the, the the radiation can can do its job is that right yeah it's, it is exactly right i i okay. think uh, we did two things with that one is laminectomy typically isn't enough but if you do your decompression you can always take an ultrasound and see if you've reconstituted the fecal sac mm -hmm. and essentially you want a two millimeter margin on the spinal cord to effectively give a dose of radiation mm -hmm. The other thing we wanted to do was, was, you know, we also went through a period where we resected every bit of tumor and um, it's too morbid for most of these patients. And we're not telling people not to take out the tumor they want to take out. I think if, you know, the other day I ended up taking out the whole vertebral body from behind and we reconstructed anteriorly with just a big cement block. And, you know, it's really easy to put in from the back. Uh, my partners at Ohio State, our last fellow, is putting cages in from the back. It's not really the point of it. The point of it is that your obligation is to reconstitute the fecal sac to create the target. And I think what you used to do was you'd have, um, you know, somebody doing an anterior approach, they take out all the bone tumor, but they leave the epidural disease behind. And all we're telling them is whatever else you do, take out the epidural disease and yeah. give us a target, right? <laughs> that That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because once we have a target, we basically feel like we can control anything. And I think you know, for Cordoma, it's, you know, the, the guys in the ivory tower would tell you, oh my God, you just, you, you ruined the chance to cure this patient. And the reality is Cordoma, for whatever reason, ends up being one of the most radiosensitive tumors to hypofractionated radiation. So, you know, the, we're tr trying to get people to do a safe resection that meets the needs of tumor control by providing a target for radiation. Awesome. Exactly. As you say, yeah. Well, great. Um, any other comments from the group? No, really appreciate it. Privilege. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Really a privilege. Yeah, amazing. Thanks, Mark. And uh, have an awesome day. Great Thanks. week. And I'm sure we'll run into you here shortly. Hope so. Thanks so much. All right. Okay, bye.